it, please. So good morning, everybody. This is Eric Pearson from Exeter. I'm the senior cybersecurity engineer uh, working in the cybersecurity end user group at Exeter. And today we're going to discuss the second of a series of webinars. The one last week or two weeks ago, I think it was, discussed a high-level view of a number of vendors' products which provided a deep packet inspection functionality. And this week we're going to go into how those vendors actually implement deep packet inspection for the Modbus TCP protocol. I'll mention at the end again, but future webinars will cover other protocols that have some sort of deep packet inspection functionality available. Not all vendors have this functionality and not all pro protocols have this functional functionality available. So I hope you enjoy. Your phones on your ends are muted. If you have a question as we get to the end of the conference, please use the chat or question box which is available to you on your web screen. So off we go. For those that don't know me and haven't been on my webinars, my name is Eric Pearson. I've been with Exeter for just about three years now. And I've got a background that is both IT related. I've been an IT manager developing network architectures, security architectures, etc., for a number of uh, multinational companies. And I've also spent about 10 or 12 years in the industrial control system world where I worked for Google Modicon for a number of years as a field support Tech, uh, engineer, technician, whatever the title was, I don't remember, uh, supporting their series of uh, process control devices like the 984, the 584, the 884, etc., which has now become the Schneider Automation series of products. I also worked for MTL, which then became Cooper Cross Heinz, which then became Eaton Enterprises, and I started off as their IT manager, and I became the manager of the Industrial Networks product portfolio and also the technical support and application manager for the Americas. So I've, I've got a varied background in both IT networking and industrial control systems. So I can talk on both fronts. So some of the background to what we're going to discuss is how we get to requiring some sort of a deep packet inspection solution. So one of the first steps which is called out in all standards, but the one that we follow most often because it's industry agnostic, it's written relatively generically that you can then modify it and apply it to your installation, is what was formerly called the ISA S99 series of documents, now being migrated to the IEC ISA 62443 series of documents. One of the major pieces of those documents is the segmentation and isolation of your process control network. And we've done many, many uh, surveys, many, many uh, cybersecurity vulnerability assessments, risk assessments, where we've gone into a facility and we encounter what can basically be described as a flat, multi-connected network. So this would be an example of, of something that we would potentially walk into. This is purely an example, not based on any actual network that we have seen. But as you can see in this, the enterprise network connects directly to the plants, the plants connect directly to the HMI or the control system level, and the control system level then has dual home servers plus an external connection down to the actual controllers. If anything happens on this network, it's pretty easy to see that it could propagate across not only the entire single plant, but potentially propagate across all the plants. And this, is, this has a similar situation to this, have actually been seen in the field. So as part of the 62443 uh, standards, one of the major steps is always to separate the critical devices into zones, implement some sort of a barrier device, generally referred to as a conduit, to limit the traffic that gets to those end devices. As part of this operation or part of this exercise, the ideal solution is to separate your Windows components, like your SCADA systems, your HMIs, your, even your embedded CE devices, from your non-Windows-based components, like your PLCs, the chart recorder scales, etc. The reason for that is, number one, a Windows device can be compromised. If there is a, a virus running around, a Windows device will probably be 
if it's not protected rather well, can be infected and affected by that virus. If it gets infected, it will probably not directly infect the PLCs or the, the non-Windows-based components, but what happens to the network due to that infection can cause unwanted or even catastrophic results on your network. So your network segmentation, the whole goal of this is that by the time you get to these end devices, only the protocols that are required to run these devices should get to them. And that's what the firewalling is doing. So here we've taken our original zoning condo, our original uh, architecture. We've reviewed what needs to happen. We've reviewed what your different sections of the plant are. And we've developed a zoning conduit architecture. So up at the top, we have our to the left, we have our connection to the internet, which is routed and firewalled. We have our uh, desktop stations of our enterprise sitting up there. We have a firewall and a router in this case, which is creating a isolated but dedic or dedicated but yet isolated connection to three plant DMZs. And the DMZs are new. The DMZs are an area where it's commonly referred to as either level 3.5 a semi-trusted network, it has a number of different names. The DMZ is your connection point to allow traffic to flow from the enterprise to the DMZ and from the control areas to the DMZ, but the enterprise is never allowed to communicate with the control area directly and vice versa. We go below the DMZ, we now have an additional firewall or a separate interface on a, the same firewall communicating with the control zones in the three plants. And we have our three servers sitting there still, the app server, the data server, and the maintenance server. However, those servers have lost their dual home cap dual NIC or dual home capability. They now have got to communicate to the main control LAN. From the control LAN down to our actual controllers, there is an additional firewall. This is where this discussion is going to come in, mostly at these firewalls down at the controller level, because that's usually where deep packet inspection is going to be used. To every hard and fast rule, there is an exception. So there could be a possibility or an instance where you would put some of these firewalls higher up in the network. A good example of that, and one we'll cover in future presentations, is, the, is an OPC aware firewall. That usually won't occur down at the controller level because controllers don't run OPC classic. So at this level, we're going to talk about the, the Modbus firewall down at the controller level protecting those controllers from unwanted traffic or commands. So okay, we've done our work. The recommendations say to segment your network. You've, we've done it on paper. We have some beautiful zones all laid out as usually happens. But now how do we actually do what we need to do? And that's where the actual work comes in. This is where the rubber hits the road. So the question is always much easier than the answer is. So we can help you with this because we, we have a lot of knowledge on these devices. So first, and if you, many of you were in my previous presentation, you'll see that a lot of these slides are similar because I assume that not everybody was in here. So these are a review of how we get to where we're going to be. We'll get to the actual implementation of the um, deep packet inspection in just a few slides. So the first step, evaluate your, your solution, evaluate the vendors that you already have an association with. Many vendors offer some sort of an industrial barrier device. Who do you have that relationship with? It doesn't necessarily mean because you need to implement this device, you need to go find a new vendor. They may have something that will work extremely well for what you need. Don't destroy that relationship. But also, do you have fault-tolerant Ethernet or any other proprietary redundancy network that you need to take into account? What's your primary protocol that you're trying to firewall? Is it Modbus TCP? Hey, lucky for us, we're going to talk about in this webinar. Other protocols have, some of the protocols, have some sort of deep packet inspection solution. Again, we'll cover those in, in future webinars. Others do not have any sort of a deep packet inspection solution yet. Some are being worked on. Um, some manufacturers have developed products specifically designed to work in their networks. Some examples, just quickly, are the Delta V controller firewall is made to work within the Delta V environment. The Honeywell CF9 is designed to work within the Honeywell fault-tolerant Ethernet environment. 
There's a number of Honeywell Tofino plug and plays, Triconics, there's one made by Solar Turbines as well. We'll cover most of these in a future webinar, um, but they are available. What do you have for special applications that may be running on your network? Do you have VPN connectivity? Do you use NATing on your network? Do you have multiple VLANs? Do you need multiple users to log in to a device and allow them different permissions? All of these need to be looked at in advance to make sure what you're going to do will work correctly. Some vendors that supply the industrial control system firewalls. Um, the reason that I keep specifying an industrial control system firewall is because, in general, a, f a router switch or firewall that has been designed for an enterprise level, a server room type environment, should not be used within an industrial control system for a number of reasons. Number one, usually its form factor is not right for the environment you're putting it in. Generally, they're 19 inch racks. Industrial uh, control firewalls generally are DIN mountable. Industrial control control firewalls almost always have redundant DC power supplies available to them. Um, the industrial control firewalls are usually, almost in all cases, there's always exceptions of course, but almost in all cases not fan cooled. They're convection cooled. So if they're in an environment that has some sort of particulate or moisture in the air, they're not drawing that into the device to coat the components. Um, they're usually higher temperature range, colder and warmer, and higher humidity range drier and wetter, where they're, again, they're made to work within the environment of an industrial control system. They're electrical and control tech friendly, where in most cases you can simply plug these things in and then go back and configure them later. They don't cause an interruption in your, in your network just because you've plugged it in. They usually have pre-programmed knowledge of many of the industrial protocols which are used in the industrial control system which are radically different than the ones that are used on an enterprise level network. Many of them do a lot more than just simply firewalling which is again what, excuse me, what we're going to talk about today. Some of the vendors which supply some industrial firewalls are the Tofino family provided by MTL, Schneider, Hirschman, uh, formerly Bayer Security, uh, now part of Hirschman had one. The new Xenon firewall, or Xenon Tofino by Hirschman. Moxa has an 800 and a 900 series uh, router firewall. Again, the MTL Tofino. Phoenix Contact has an MGuard. Siemens has a Scalance. And there's a number of others that are out there on the market today. A few of the device specifics, and again, the red circle is the one that we are going to discuss today is a number of them had Modbus, Ethernet IP, um, OPC awareness. They can be used as a layer two, a non-routing, or a layer three routing device in some cases. Some of them have integrated web interfaces for configuration. Some of them use a centralized management software package. Some have a combination of both. Um, the ones we're going to discuss today are the Tofino family, and the Moxa 900 family. Those are the two that I have uh, evaluation units of that I can, I can show actual screenshots. So Modbus TCP in general, it's very similar to the older Modbus RTU, which is still found very frequently in an industrial control system. Devices on both ends require an IP address. It's a TCP, which is a connection-oriented connection on the uh, Ethernet wire. If you're familiar with networking technologies, there are two major types of communication. UDP, which is non-connection oriented, it's just send and forget, much like this webinar. And TCP, which is connection oriented, which requires that it send a message, get a response. Send a message, get a response. It's a slower, everything is relative here, you're on an Ethernet network, so it's going in a pretty good clip. It's a slower type of communication, but it guarantees the message got there, and it guarantees the message got there correctly. Modbus uses a master-slave functionality, where the master makes a request and the slave responds to it. When you're working with computers in general, the master-slave functionality is conceptually reversed from what everybody is used to as a client-server orientation or client-server configuration, where the client makes a request of the server. 
So keep that in mind when you're discussing Modbus devices on an Ethernet network versus your computers communicating to each other. Master slave in Modbus is conceptually reversed than client server. The function codes and the responses on the Ethernet network are exactly the same as they were on the serial network, RS-232 and RS-485. The difference is they've now been encapsulated within the Ethernet frames. And it runs as fast as your underlying Ethernet network can run, whether you're 10 meg, 100 meg, 1 gig, or 10 gig. That's how fast the Ethernet uh, Modbus will run. So a little bit of rundown of how the Modbus application works uh, at the functional level because we're going to be getting into this in a few minutes. So the Modbus layer, when a master makes a request of a slave, it, if the slave device has a unit address, it puts that into the message so the slave knows who to answer, which slave knows which to answer. Then it puts in a function code and the function code is the instruction of what the master is looking for. It could be a read, it could be a write, it could be a read or write of one or read or write of many. It could be a program function. So it all depends on what that function code is, but to a stateful firewall, this transmission looks exactly the same. It goes to an IP address with a port address, the port being 502 for Modbus. So when you have a pure stateful firewall, which is what many, many firewalls before this were, they couldn't determine what was happening inside that packet. They just knew it was Modbus. So now we're going to dig deeper. So the, the slave, your, in this case, let's consider it to be a PLC, responds to the master by saying, hey, this is me. This is the function code you asked for. And this is the data that's, that you are now getting. So if I read a coil or read a register, then that data would be held within this packet response. If I read a number of coils or a number of registers, then that data would be contained within this packet response. So it gets one message out, send me some information, it gets a response with, which begins as basically the duplicate of that request with the data appended to it. If a request is made that can't be done by the slave, um, the PLC only has 100 registers and you try to read register 101, the slave responds still, but it responds with an exception code. So in this case, we're sending out, again, slave address 5. We're saying function code 16. Uh, I don't know what it is offhand. It doesn't matter. But I'm saying read register 1001. Well, my PLC conceptually only has 1,000 registers. So my PLC is going to respond, hey, this is me. That's my slave address. I'm going to send you back your requested function code incremented by an 80, 80 hex. So that 80 hex makes my response code 96. I had an error in the request you gave me. It also gives the exception code. Why did this command get rejected? And that uh, exception code is in a, a table you can find for Modbus. In this case, we're having an illegal data address. I don't have the address that you asked me to read, so I'm telling you that. But I still responded to your request. So how do we go about getting the information we need to populate our Modbus uh, deep packet inspection devices. Well, the first thing is we have to actually see what's going on on the network. This is what takes quite a bit of networking experience and networking knowledge because you have to understand what is going on on the network to begin with to know what to do with it. So in this case, we, we have two methods of, how, of what, how we can look at it. One is port mirroring. Most industrial switches allow you to mirror ports to a single port which you can then use as a, as a capturing device. The other way is many of, some of the devices, I can't say many, some of the devices have an integrated sniffing capability. So you can actually use the device to capture the traffic that you're trying to firewall. So in this case, we've used Wireshark. Wireshark is your friend when you're investigating this traffic. Wireshark understands Modbus TCP. It knows what to do with it when it sees it on the network. So in this case, we're using Wireshark to, to monitor the traffic between these two devices. And if you look at the very first line, 
I'm talking from ad address 10 to the device at address 1. And I opened up my, my detail of my packet, and Wireshark told me that it's a Modbus command. It's function code read holding registers, function code 3. Reference number, that's your starting address, of 12288. And it's telling me I want to read 100 registers. It just told me everything I needed about this command to begin programming it. So we're going to start with a MOXA device. This is the MOXA 902. MOXA 902 has a web-based interface. Um, if you had access to my previous webinar, I showed how the rules are set up within the MOXA, within the Phoenix Contact, and within the Tofino devices. This is I'm not going to go into how to set these rules up. In this webinar, I will show you the rules in place. So if you need to go back to the original webinar, it has been recorded. It's available. Contact the uh, Exeter office to be able to get access to that uh, original excuse me, webinar. So in this case, we first have to tell the firewall itself that we want to allow Modbus to pass through the firewall. So we set a rule simply that says from, and, and Mox's nomenclature is a WAN and LAN type configuration. So the input is the WAN, which can be called an unprotected port. It can be called LAN 1 in some cases. Moxa has called it the WAN port. Going to the LAN port, it, it knows what Modbus TCP is by name in the configuration. I tell it what device is allowed to communicate, and I tell it what the source port, for those that um, are familiar with computers in general, a source port is a pseudo-random port that's generated by the requesting device. It can be almost any number. So you have to allow most source ports to be all. We are talking to the device at address 1.1, and we are talking to, to uh, destination port 502, which will always be Modbus in this case. Modbus always answers to port 502. We're not worried about MAC addresses at this point because we're using the IP address, and we're going to accept the traffic passing through. Now, all good firewall um, standards, all best practice steps, Say, after you've allowed your traffic to pass through a firewall, the last rule that you want is a deny all. And you want to take that deny all, and you want to log it. Because if something's happening on your network, you want some sort of visibility to that. So I've allowed Modbus to pass through my network. That's all I need for this uh, device. My next rule is a drop all. That drop all is going to generate a log entry. So I can go to my logs, and I can look, and I can see if I'm being attacked or I'm getting excessive other type of traffic flowing through my network that I may want to investigate further. So now that we've done our overall Modbus rule, now we're going to walk in to the actual deep packet inspection settings for the MOXA device. In this case, rule number one, again, we're going to have a WAN to a LAN connection, protocols TCP, we covered that earlier, from address 10 going to address 1. Slave ID of 0 means we're not using a slave ID. Uh, uh, most Ethernet devices, because there's one device connected to, the, to an IP address, the slave address is generally assumed to be 0. Don't use a slave address. If you are using something like a Modbus gateway, which takes the Ethernet connection converts it to, let's say, an RS-485 multi-drop serial connection, and now you put three or four or five or six Modbus devices behind that serial gateway, those Modbus devices have to have separate slave IDs. They're all answering to the same IP address. Again, this is where networking technology and the, mo and the industrial control system technologies all merge together. So if you have a, a PLC that has plugged directly into, eth into the Ethernet uh, cable, that's going to have an IP address. And who cares what the slave address is, because it's the only device answering to that IP address. If you have a Modbus gateway which has the IP address, you may have a number of devices behind them all answering to the same IP address. That's where the slave ID will come in. OK, we've beat that horse to death. Next thing we're going to look at is the function code that we want to use. Moxa knows what the function code 3 is. It's read holding registers. Now you put in the address of the registers 
that you want to read. And if you remember earlier, we said we started at 12288 for a quantity of 100. Well, we've actually put 101 in here. It was easier to write. So this allows an address of 12288 to 12388. It actually should be 12387 to be exactly 100, but that's okay. Reading isn't really a problem. And we want to accept the traffic passing through. The second line is unique to the MOXA configuration. The MOXA requires you to put in a rule to allow the slave response to come back from the device. Um, so in this case, it's LAN to WAN. It's the reverse. It's coming through from dot .1, which is my PLC, to dot .10, which is my HMI, all slave IDs, and all holding registers. So what this is doing is for any read holding register request that goes out to this device, the slave response is permitted to come back. And again, this is a configuration uniqueness to the MOXA devices. The next line, line three, is all other function codes trying to be passed to all devices through this firewall are going to be dropped and logged. Again, that's firewall best practice. Next, we're going to look at the Tofino. This is traffic from an original, we'll call it version one Tofino type device. So if you put the LSMs in a Tofino and you don't set any rules and you set it to test mode, you will start seeing the traffic flowing through that Tofino. So in this case, we've got some non-IP traffic flowing through and then we've got some IP traffic, which is port 502, which is our Modbus traffic. So now we're going to, we've identified the Modbus traffic that we're going to use. Now we have to work with it. So the first thing we're going to do is we go into the, the uh, central management platform for the Tofino and we add a rule to allow Modbus to flow through the device. So from the HMI to the PLC, we're going to allow Modbus to flow through. We then set, and this is a configuration setting within the Tofino, we then set the traffic to go to the enforcer module. The enforcer module is the trade name for their deep packet inspection uh, functionality. Once we send it to the enforcer module, we now have to account for the same information that we did for the MOXA. The first thing we put in place is the fact, or look for, is the fact that we need to know the function code. Then we need to know what addresses are trying to be accessed by that function code, and then we need to know how many of them. The Tofino will give you all this information as you step through. You should know it in advance. You should know what your program, what your um, control system is trying to do. The, to the, the, the devices that you're putting on the network can help you get there, but that's no replacement for knowing the functionality of your system. So once we do we know what we need to put in. We go into the deep packet inspection or the enforcer module of the Tofino, and we have the HMI being the device that's trying to communicate. We want function code three, and then we tell it the registers that it's allowed to communicate with, and it's up and running. The newer series of Tofino, called the Tofino Xenon, does not have the same um, logging or traffic capture functionality as the original Tofino. So you either need to use a Wireshark method or the internal three methods actually. The original Wireshark method, you can use a syslog discovery if you want to send the traffic to a syslog and do it that way, or you can use its, its internal log capture tools and look at the, the traffic that way. All three work. They will all give similar devices. So once identified, the traffic is identified, the steps to do the deep packet inspection are very, very similar. First, you set a firewall rule allowing Modbus to pass through the device from a device to a device in an inbound direction. And the MOXA had the same thing. You're only allowing that traffic to flow inbound initially. Once it, the connection is established, traffic flows in both directions. The ARP rule at the top of the Xenon, very similar to the way the MOXA had a specific configuration requirement. The uh, Tofino has, this, has a similar configuration requirement where in order for your network to operate correctly, you need to allow the ARP protocol to pass through 
to identify the systems on your network. So the very first rule is generally an ARP message to an ARP rule to allow it. Once you put in the rule for Modbus, the next step, similar to the, the older Tofino, is to send it to the enforcer module. The enforcer module in the Tofino is a little bit different, but it performs the same functionality. With the Xenon, you can either select a predefined portfolio of what you want to do. In this case, we can allow all read-only message to come through. We can allow all read-write, but it doesn't include programming. Or we can allow programming messages to pass through, or we can allow everything to pass through. If you check the advanced button and the advanced box, which is what I did, I now am allowed to enter in a single function code, and it tells me what that function code does, and the address range for the coils or registers that that function code is operating on. So it lets me get very granular in the advanced tab, lets me get very granular in what I'm trying to do with the device. So we're going to look at some actual network devices, network results. This is looking at a small HMI which is, uh, was developed to demo the Tofino. So in this case, the yellow arrows point to the fact that I've changed the RPM of the output side. And what this does is cause more demand on the input side. So I actually see the demand change and I see my RPM numbers change. This tells me that I'm reading the device correctly. I'm getting a response to my Modbus messages. My deep packet inspection settings for this function code are in place and working correctly. But I haven't put any function codes in to allow a write function to be performed. So in this case, there's a set point setting, and I click the change box, and I'm going to change my set point to 80. When I hit OK, and I, go, I look at the screen, my set point stayed at 40. So my write function code was not allowed to pass through to the end device to change the setting. In this case, I didn't want it. So some of the final steps that you need to do is make sure you test, because of what, the, what I just showed you with the right function code, make sure you test all of the functions that are needed to operate your process. Because a deep packet inspection mistake will not show up in the same way that a simple stateful firewall rule will. If you have a stateful firewall rule, rule wrong, you may not be able to communicate to the end device at all. When you have a deep packet inspection rule wrong, you may be able to communicate somewhat. In this case, I'm able to read that device, but I may not be able to write to change a set point because I forgot to enter that rule in. So all of these, all the deep packet inspection or all the functionality of the process needs to be tested before you assume that you've got all your rules correct. Any deny traffic, like I've said earlier, best practice is always with a firewall, but especially with deep packet inspection, is to send that deny traffic to a logging device for review to see if you're getting either unwanted traffic to that device from, from something that shouldn't be communicating or possibly a write command because of a, a system that's trying to change a set point or something and it hasn't been allowed to pass through the deep packet inspection device. So that gives a, a relatively detailed overview of the devices that, have, that I have access to. There are others out there I don't have access to. The devices that have deep packet inspection functionality. I hope it gave you a good overview of how it gets done, what's required to do it, how technically advanced it is compared to simply putting a network in or putting a firewall in. Um, there'll be future webinars coming up covering other protocols. The ones that I have access to are an OPC. Uh, inspection firewall, Ethernet IP, and I'll do the, some plug-and-play devices that I have access to. And because of the amount of content of those, I'll, there'll probably be one more webinar covering this. So if anybody has any questions, again, I thank you for attending. If anybody has any questions, they can type, type them in the chat box, and I'll answer them as best I can. And we'll allow a couple of minutes for some questions to come in. I don't see any questions. And I guess that's good, or I've lost you all, one of the two.
Oh, I see one. Um, I have a message from Rahul that says, what are other methods? I don't know what you mean by that. For firewall testing, I need more information. Um, give me more to go on what you mean by for firewall testing. I don't know what that means. Uh, for Modbus TCP, you still haven't given me enough to go on, Rahul. I, I don't know what you're looking for. Uh, just a general, are we able to have more than 24-hour notice before each webinar, please? I will pass that along to our marketing group, absolutely. Um, do any of the devices have a learn mode where you can run the device for, say, a month and say that all types of Modbus usage? Yes, they are developing that now. Um, uh, let me think a second. Give me a second to think. Um, Phoenix Contact? No, I'm sorry. Phoenix Contact has a learn mode, but they don't have the deep packet inspection for Modbus. Um, Belden, in some of their products right now, has a learn mode, not in the Tofino line. So they will be able to capture the fact that it's Modbus traffic, but not the um, function code that's trying to be allowed. So they're, whether they develop this learning mode for the Tofino, I don't know but they do have it in some of their other products, like the Eagle One, which is not a deep packet inspection capable firewall. Um, so it require a manual entry to follow for the, yes, that's a true, that is true, Chris. It, it requires manual entry of the function codes. Again, this takes, this is not something that should be taken on by somebody that does not know networking technologies pretty well, because you're in there messing around with the actual communication of the function codes. Um, Moxa just sent me a note two, three weeks ago asking me questions on a learning mode functionality. And so they may have one coming out within a year or so as well. They need to be very careful because um, one of the things you have to remember when you're doing this, and most vendors like putting, as anybody does, putting things into a greenfield, a new situation, a new installation. Hey, we can do whatever, we can set it up, we can make it work, we can test it. 99% of the things that you're doing and I'm doing is in an existing environment. I cannot cause a problem on that network. So I have to be very, very careful what I do. My, and this leads into this learning mode. I can't plug something in that doesn't pass unless I have some sort of a, excuse me, free, free pass to pass it through. And it can't affect the current network traffic. So I know a couple are working on it. Um, they haven't gotten to the point at this point where they will do the deep packet inspection learning just yet. Um, so let me see. Wireshark is a free tool, correct? It's a free download from the internet. Um, learn mode. Uh, I'll pass the thing. The, the, I, I, Rahul, I still don't know what you mean by uh, from Modbus. So do most devices have a stored config file of DPI such that you need to replace a device you can capture existing? Um, the new Tofino does, and the, uh, let me see, config file. Most of them allow you to upload or download the configuration to be able to use it somewhere else. What the issue there is generally the IP addresses are wrong, so you have to be very careful when you copy and paste configurations, because if you have a different IP address, you've created a rule that's not going to work. Um, most of the newer devices, the original Tofino, you cannot copy and paste. You just, you had to enter the rules in, but remember, when you're doing these configurations on these industrial firewalls, you're down in the lower levels of your network. And this is something that is different than the barrier, the excuse me, the interface or the uh, enterprise level firewalls, where you can have 100 or 200 rules in your firewall. Generally, these firewalls, I, I've, done over, I've done hundreds of them. If they have more than 10 rules, we need to look at how you segmented your network. So generally, you have more deny no log rules because I don't want to see all this extra noise and traffic. Then you do allow rules. So it's even if you have a hundred devices, which I've programmed before, it's it's time consuming in the the fact that you have to put each one in, but it doesn't take all that long to do. To be honest, the newer ones again, you do. Have have a configuration you can download and upload. You've got to be careful because the, some of them have uh, hard-coded IDs in the devices where you can't exchange actual configurations, but you can copy and paste the rules, things like that. Depends on the device. There are different ways to do it. Um, does ISA specify DPI mandatory for Modbus? It does not. However, 
if you're trying to lock down your system and get the best bang for your buck and you have an example that's always used is a custody transfer device you, you would never want somebody un, un, unauthorized to write to that device and if you use a simple firewall to protect it you don't get that level of protection where if you put some sort of a deep packet device in and only allow read function codes to pass through you can never write to that device it gets blocked before it ever gets there so while it does not specify deep packet inspection this as you increase your, your SL your security levels you might want to start looking at a higher level of protection than what is just simply specified if they say segment your network and put barrier devices into segment traffic well, that's, that's, that's like anything else, a basic step, a standard starting point. You can always go better, and this is what that is. Um, Rahul, if you've got more on what you want to ask about what are the methods for firewall testing for Modbus, I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking still. So, um, Let me see. At the level where this firewall will be installed, where would you recommend logging to where these logs could be accessed for automated higher scans of mobile this level? Uh, we tip can manage my system so it makes it hard to automate. No hard and fast because I don't need a network. But generally, um, if you allowed, let's say in this case, a syslog server, which is a known standard port, it's generally a UDP type communication. Um, that that could be a common okay that could be a common one you could use these don't generally generate that much traffic on the network and the more you can like I mentioned earlier this deny no log because Windows will always be Windows it's very chatty but I don't want to know every time Windows decides to talk on the network so deny no log that so the only thing you see back going into your syslog are things which you don't know about for, for saying it a better way um, there's no one right answer but if you're going to allow syslog, then you'd put syslog in an area where it can be seen by these devices. And most people do run some sort of a syslog solution, whether it's syslog itself or not. So I don't have an answer as far as this is where you should put it, but because I don't know your network. But generally, a syslog communication passes through to, I mean, if you put it at the, uh, the control system, the HMI level, and have a syslog server there that could be used to generate alarms on your network, which is a very common thing. That would work for you. All right, I'm not getting any more questions. Uh, okay, that makes. I'm glad it does. <laughs> Thank you. All right, with that, we will call this presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. I hope uh, those that came found it technical enough to be interested, and those that didn't 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 find it too technical to be boring. So we will repeat this at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.